so we've got a few more topics. The, the next topic is fitting neural networks. And you see we put the, the little uphill car there because this, this is potentially a little bit more challenge, challenging. <laughs> oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> sorry. Can I leave now? <laughs> Can you leave now? <laughs> sure. No, this is if you're gonna if you're gonna <laughs> fall asleep, please don't <laughs> snore. It's fascinating stuff. Okay. <laughs> so we put up a picture of our simplest neural network. We put an objective, say sum of squares, and we want to minimize the sum of squares. And we've expanded f of x there, and you see we've got parameters beta and the w's in this simple little one. We've got training data. We've got n observations. We want to minimize sum of squares. That means we want to learn the w's and the beta from those data. Okay. Turns out the problem is difficult because the objective is non-convex. And we'll show you what that means in a moment. It turns out, however, despite this, the effective, that effective algorithms have evolved that can optimize complex neural networks um, efficiently. So let's look at that in a little bit more detail. So here's a non-convex function. We just show you a one-dimensional function. And we're going to use gradient descent to optimize this function. So you can see here, we write the, the function now. We, we, we use a, the collective term theta to represent all the parameters. So our objective we write as r of theta. And it's a sum of squares. And theta consists of all the w's and the beta. Right? And now we try and depict it in one dimension. And the way gradient descent works is you start with some guess for theta, and we start off with a guess over here. And this orange curve here is the function r of theta. So if theta was one dimensional, this is a non-convex function, which what that means is it doesn't have a single minimum. It's got, this one's got two minimas. Right? It comes down and then goes up again. It's got lots of hills and valleys, two, in, two valleys in this case. And what gradient descent does is you start at a guess. You figure out a direction to move. In this case, we're either going to go left or right. And you move a little bit in that direction. And you pick the direction so that you're going downhill because we want to get to a minimum. And so you go downhill a little way and you get to the next guess. And you keep on doing that, moving downhill, moving downhill, until you can't move downhill anymore. OK? And so in this case, we get down to this point, which is, as far as we know, a local minimum. Actually, in this picture, it looks like a global minimum. If we'd started a little bit to the left of the starting point, we would have gone in the opposite direction and got, and got caught up in a local minimum. So that's how gradient descent works. Okay, so the trick is to find these directions to move. So this in one dimensional, as I said, you only go left or right a certain distance. But when you're in higher dimensions, you have to decide which direction to move in, in that parameter space and how much to move in that direction. So a little bit more detail. In, in the simple, ex as I said, we reach the global minimum. If we start a little to the left of theta naught, we would have got to a local minimum. And if the dimension's higher, we have to decide on the direction. So how to find a direction delta that points downhill? Well, we need to compute what's known as a gradient vector. And the gradient vector, computed at some current point theta t, is the vector of derivatives of the function, which is a function of this multi-parameter theta, at each of the coordinates of theta. So if, if theta's got m coordinates, this gradient vector is going to be an m vector and consist of what's known as partial derivatives. Okay. Now, it's a fact of calculus that the gradient always points uphill. So the, the gradient has components in it and it tells you which direction in space to move. And if you move a little bit in that direction, you're going to be going uphill. So that means the way we want to move is the opposite of the gradient. So we put a minus sign in front of the gradient, and that'll make us go downhill, which is what we want to do. And then we multiply it by some small number rho. You can see rho here is 0 0.001. That's a typical number. And that says, you know, this gradient is going to recommend a certain distance to go as well as direction. 
we want to be really cautious. So we, we want to just go a small little bit in that direction to make sure we, we're going downhill because you can overstep and end up the gradient maybe off. And if you go the full distance, you can start going up again. So this row is a way of slowing things down. And so that leads to the update in the parameter. Theta t plus one is theta t minus rho times the gradient. If this is a, a little beyond your math skills, don't worry. This is built into the, the algorithms that we use. And, you know, this is just to give you, a, for those who understand the calculus, it's a way of understanding what's going on. So let me go back to the previous picture there. One of the things that makes this area so complex, and it's actually a very hot area now in, in uh, machine learning and optimization, figuring out algorithms for neural networks. Even if you could, you could get the global minimum on the right there, it's not clear that's, what you, that's the solution you want, right? You remember the example we had with what, 60,000 observations and 200,000 parameters? Yeah. The global minimum could, could be overfit quite badly. Yes. So we don't, we, even, even if we could get the global minimum, we often don't want it. So there's a lot of study now about, of, the, of, the, of the gradient descent and stochastic gradient descent that figures out, just tries to figure out just what solution does it find? Yes. Because it seems to work well yeah. in practice, but people don't really understand that. Yeah, exactly. I think in the, in the early days of neural networks, they, they would, you know, you have to start at some value. They'll pick some small value, to random value to start yeah. with. They'd fit the network many times, starting at different random values and average the solutions. And that turned out to be a, a, a better thing to do than just go to right. one global minimum. So I'm saying typically these problems can have thousands of local minima, yeah. right? And just which one we want and which one the algorithms tend to find is really not clear. Okay, so there's a gradient. If you, thought, if, you thought, if you thought this was complex, this slide's even more complex. <laughs> okay. okay, so how do we compute the gradients? So there's a, there's a technique called backpropagation. So again, let's look at the simplest case. We see the loss function, r of theta, is actually a sum from one to n of ri of theta, right? Because it's just summed over the observations. And ri of theta, I've just written it out here, is yi minus f theta of xi squared. And in expanded form, we can write it like this. Well, when we compute the gradient of r of theta, the way gradients works is you can compute the gradient of each of these components and then sum them, then you get the gradient of r of theta. Because r of theta is a sum over these n terms. We can compute the gradient of each piece and then sum to get the gradient. So now we need to be able to compute the, the derivative of this function with respect to all the betas and all the w's. Okay, so just a bit of notation. We'll let zk be the, the linear combination inside here, just for ease of notation. So now we use what's known as the chain rule of differentiation. So let's first differentiate with respect to a beta. So if we, we, we first differentiate the sum of squares with respect to f of theta, and then f of theta with respect to beta, okay? And when you do it in those two steps and then multiply them together, this is what you get, this expression over here. For the w's, we do differentiate with respect to f of theta again, then f of theta with respect to g of, of zk, g of zk with respect to zk, and then zk with respect to w. So four steps in the chain. And when you do each of those and multiply them together, you get this expression over here. And the nice thing here in this example and squared error loss, we see that the first piece in both of them is the residual. So the residual is telling you what error you're making for that observation. And what you can think of these multipliers on the residual they're a way of spreading the residual down to all the different units that are responsible for that residual, right? So you're propagating the residual backwards to the, the activations and, and, and therefore the weights in the, in the network. And so this is a simple a network, but the same idea gets used on the most complex networks. And the nice thing today is you can have uh, the computer programs know how to automatically differentiate functions and so we don't even have to think about it. It just gets done automatically. Okay, so this, I agree, this is quite technical, but this is a technical section, and, and that's the idea of backpropagation. Could you go over that again? 
<laughs> okay, okay. I will not go over it again. Okay. I guess, importantly, there's some tricks of the trade. So one is slow learning. So it turns out gradient descent is a slow way of optimizing. And a small learning rate row even slows it further. And so one of the ideas is to use early stopping as a form of regularization. So even though you've got a very highly parameterized network, and if you fit it all the way down till you reach a minimum, you're going to overfit. The gradient descent is a nice slow way of getting there. And if you stop early, you may end up in a really good spot. We saw that with the, with the um, IMDB reviews when we trained a network. There was a figure, the, the performance of the, the network on the test data, it peaked very quickly at around 0.88 and then started going down. Mm -hmm. That was, those epochs were measuring iterations of training. What's used pretty much in all neural networks now is stochastic gradient descent. And what, what you do is rather than compute the gradient using all the data, you use a small mini batch drawn at random at each step. So for example, with MNIST, you've got 60,000 training observations but you may use a mini batches of just 128 observations drawn at random from those training data. So you take the 128 observations, you compute the gradient based on them, and you make your small gradient a step uh, just using them. You can imagine that cuts down on the computation dramatically. Okay, so we talked of epochs. So the epoch is a count of iterations, and it amounts to the number of mini batch updates such that n samples in total have been processed, right? So if we use 128, it's going to be 60,000 over 128, which means 469 mini batch updates amounts to going through an equivalent of n, or the full n training samples, 60,000. That's an epoch. In addition, we use regularization. So ridge and lasso regularization can be used to shrink the weights at each layer. And two other popular forms of regularization are dropout and augmentation, which we're going to discuss next. So what you do with dropout is a simple little network. And you can see the original network. And here we've colored some of the units gray. We've colored an input unit gray, and we've colored, colored two of the hidden units gray. So at each mini batch stochastic gradient descent update, what you do is re randomly remove units with probability phi, maybe 0.4 or something like that, and scale up the weights of those retained by an amount to compensate. It turns out you want to do 1 over 1 minus phi. You just remove those units and ignore them. So in simple scenarios, like linear regression, it turns out a version of this process can be shown to be equivalent to ridge regularization. So as in ridge, the other units stand in for those temporarily removed and their weights are drawn closer together. And so that's become a very popular form for, for regularization of deep networks. And of course, it speeds up the learning as well, because you've got less units to process. It's similar to randomly emitting variables when growing trees in random forests. So if you remember in random forests, when each time you get a bootstrap sample, you train a tree, you randomly ignore subsets of variables. It's the same idea. And the inventors of dropout acknowledge the random forests and, and Leo Breiman's contribution there. The other interesting form of regularization is called data augmentation. Okay. So here's a picture, just two-dimensional picture. The orange points are your actual data points. You can see the data, they've just got x1 and x2, they're somewhat correlated. What we do is, in this case, we've randomly added a little cloud of data points around each original data point. So we augment the data set with random versions of the original data point with a little bit of noise, okay? But for each of those, we use the same Y value as the original data point. So we've just perturbed the feature point by these random draws, okay? So what this does is makes the fit robust to small perturbations in each of the XIs. And it turns out, in, in an ordinary least square setting, this is exactly equivalent to rig, ridge regularization. Okay. 
So that's just the heuristic that we want to use in the case for images. So in images, what you can do is something similar. Each time you draw a mini batch for stochastic gradient descent, you draw an image, let's say it's one of the 128 images you're going to draw at random. You draw an image, and then at random, you apply some natural transformation to that image. Like you rotate the tiger's head a little bit. You enlarge it a little bit. You change the attitude, you stretch it. You maybe change the color or the hue. But these transformations are all transformations that wouldn't confuse a human. We'll still recognize this as a tiger. So you can think of this as, as creating around the original tiger a cloud of different versions of the same tiger, but somehow they all represent that same tiger. So that's like adding the random noise. And of course, the label for all of those images is tiger. Okay. And when you do that, it improves the, the performance a lot. And you can think of it as a form of, of, of ridge regularization. In the community, they think of it as augmentation. You're just increasing the training sample size, which of course is going to, you know, that's, that's going to prevent overfitting because now you've got a bigger a training sample size. You can fit the model more accurate, accurately. But through this heuristic, you can think of it as a form of ridge regularization. It sounds like it would do more than just regularize, but also make it more robust for future predictions, right? Yes. Because if the system was presented with a, a rotated tiger, yes. you might not normally recognize it. Yeah. And, and this idea has been around for a while, wasn't it? Yeah. Uh, I think they're called hints. Hints. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So these, yeah. you can think of these as hints. You're putting in different versions of the tiger and you're yeah. saying, by the way, these are also a tiger. And you don't, you know, you don't have to get new data. You can just do that. 